Hi, I'm Pastor Rick Adams, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today on A Heart for God. We here at Greater Portland Baptist Church appreciate your time, and we have a special gift that we'd like to send you just for watching today's program. Our heart's desire is to glorify God and to help others come to know Jesus Christ more personally. I promise you that every message that you hear will be right from the Bible and will offer you hope and answers to some of life's toughest questions. We're now celebrating 30 years of ministry here at Greater Portland Baptist Church, and we have never been more committed to the preaching and teaching of God's Word than we are right now. I'd like to also invite you to come and personally visit Greater Portland so that you can experience the love of God and other Christians for yourself. Well, we're going to jump right into the preaching of God's Word. We are a family-oriented church, so why don't you gather everyone around, sit back, relax, and be challenged as my staff and I bring today's message. Now, after the message, we would like to ask you to respond to the invitation and let us know of your needs and decisions by calling or going to our website. They're both on the screen for your convenience. We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you, and thank you for watching A Heart for God. It was all because of God's amazing grace. Yes. Isn't that great? Amazing grace, oh, how sweet the sound that saved a sinner like me. Though once I was lost, but now I'm found. Though I was blinded, now I see. It was all because of God's amazing grace. Because on Calvary's mountain, he took a place, and some day, some glorious morning, I shall see him face to face, all because of God's amazing grace. Through disappointments and danger too, through labors and sorrows we've God's grace has cried it safely through, and it will surely lead us home. And it's all because of God's amazing grace, because on Calvary's mountain He took my place, and some day, some glorious morning, I shall see him face to face, all because of God's amazing grace. Then with the ransomed around God's throne, we'll praise the Redeemer and King. We'll tell how his mercies for us did atone through countless ages this song we'll sing it was all because of God's amazing grace because on Calvary's mountain he took my place and some day some glorious morning I shall see him face to face, all because of God's amazing grace. And some day, some glorious morning, I shall see him face to face, all because of God's amazing grace. So I want you to read along Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer 
stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? You see, this lawyer was the one that interpreted the law. And so Jesus turned the circle on him and said, You tell me, you, you're the one that interprets the law. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Let's pray. Father, it's, it's your word today from which we begin this message, and it's where we will find not only our beginning, but also our conclusion. You said in your word, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Let us fear God. Keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Lord, you've left us here with a responsibility to show a world Jesus. You've left us here as Christians to be a light and to be salt in darkness, uh, to be that light. And Lord, I pray that today you will help us. I know today that there's some people that I've talked to through this week that do not know Jesus but they sure would like to. And maybe today the Word of God and your Holy Spirit will work, and maybe today they would give their heart to you. Lord, if you would speak to those of us that know you, but perhaps we hadn't shown you very well, I pray that you'll help us. And Lord, today, to not only show that love works, but also that love cares. And we'll thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask it. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. In the beginning of this year, we introduced our theme, and most of you are familiar with that theme. It's on the uh, wall behind me that simply states, Love Works. I shared with you from James chapter 2 as we began this year that it says, What does it profit, my brethren? Uh, though a man say he hath faith and he has not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Verse 17 says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith and I have works, then James says, you show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou sayest, thou believe that there is a God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? What God is saying is that in his word that we can talk about loving God and talk about loving Jesus and all of the things that we religious people do pretty well, and it comes to the end of it all, it really doesn't mean anything to have a profession of faith without a personal application of that faith. 
And what the Bible teaches us is that unto him that knoweth to do good, unto those of us that know Jesus as our Savior and we know what we're to do, then the Bible says if we don't do that which is good, then it's sin. According to Matthew 22, 34 through 40, we saw that love that works loves God and loves others. There's no way around it. If we love God, then we're going to love others. And that's what Jesus said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. It's the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then it says in verse 40, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This year, we've given uh, our church and all of its members the opportunity to get involved in many Love Works projects. I'm going to name just a few. There has been the My Father's House where we are working and continue to support a, uh, a place not far from here for homeless families to get off of the street and to get plugged into another place and get shelter and to get on their feet. And you have been very instrumental in helping a family do that. And now another family, as we have begun again to refurbish and to help my father's house assist those homeless families. There's the Human Solutions Family Shelter just down the street on Stark, where uh, we are involved at the opening. We were involved in helping provide meals, and we still, on a monthly basis, go down to Human uh, solutions and we furnish the meals. We prepare it and serve it and are involved in helping those families. And many of you have been involved just around the corner on Stark and 182nd is the Good News Medical Clinic where our friend Dr. Bob Sason and his wife, uh, missionaries uh, from off the field, medical missionaries are serving here in Rockwood and we have helped them in their effort to offer medical care and offer the different assistance that's needed for people that can't help themselves. And then we have had the neighborhood cleanups, the transit, uh, mass transit coffee and water and the school bus drivers and the first responders lunch and the care that we've offered them, the school lunches to the uh, teachers and to the school next door. We have provided and served the lunches for the students over there and the teachers and the many homeless bags that we have put together, the gallon bags with all of the necessary items that's necessary to survive and it would help them uh, during the winter months. We did it in the spring and through the summer. How many of you understand now in the winter, uh, the seasons demand different needs? And how many of you have uh, thought about when we had the storm that was not yesterday. How many of you thought about, how many of you actually thought about the homeless? Those that, where were they going to go? What were they going to do? My heart was burdened as I drove under 205 where uh, division goes underneath 205. There were uh, some tents set up there and people were just trying to get out of the wind and out of the rain. Uh, what I'm saying is that whether you like the situation or not, uh, the homeless are people that God loves and we need to care about. Now, I think we ought to help find a solution, but Jesus told us the poor you're going to have with you always. But the poor, Jesus said, when we do it unto the least of these, we've done it unto him. And so what I want us to see is that these projects that we've been involved in uh, is simply fleshing out the idea that love if we, have, if we love God, we ought to love our neighbor or to love others. But this, this fall, uh, we're going to flesh out the truth to another level with what we have termed simply love cares. If you look with me in Psalm 142, I want you to notice it says there, you'll hear this often over the next few weeks. It says, I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. The idea there is that David had over 600 men, most scholars would say, in his army at that time. But as he had all of those men surrounded him, a truth stands out in that where he said in verse 4, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge fell me, 
And if you underline in your Bible, underline those next six words. They say, no man cared for my soul. You know, David discovered what some of you discovered. You can be surrounded by people and still be alone. You can be surrounded by people that are busy and rushing to and fro and still find yourself alone. And this statement where it says, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me, and no man cared for my soul. I've already announced it, but on November the 6th, we're hosting a Love Cares Sunday. And if there's anything that I want Greater Portland to be known for, is I want them to be known as a church that preaches the Bible, the Word of God. But as, as people hear about Greater Portland Baptist Church, one of the things that I want them to know is that we care about them. I was visiting not long ago, and I was talking to somebody, and the man told me, he says, Pastor, I'm not interested in your church. As a matter of fact, I'm never going to go to your church. I'm not interested. And I said, okay. I said, you know where we are, right? He says, yes, I read your signs every time I drive by there two or three times a day. I said, well, I want you to remember this, that the church that you drive by and read those signs, that the pastor whose name out there is on that sign, came to your house. I don't know how many times you've had a preacher come to your house, but I want you to know that this church came to your house. And I want you to know that we care about you. And I said, I don't know when it'll happen. And I don't know what will take place. But if life continues as it does, at some point, at some time, you're going to be called in a crisis. And you may need somebody that cares about you. And when you begin to think about, maybe I need to go to church. Maybe I need to call a pastor. I don't want you to think twice before you remember. I said, if you need something, you call us. I can't tell you how many times I've met people in the grocery store. Or I've met them when they've come to the church and said, you may not remember me, but you came by my house and you said you cared. I want us to be known as a church that genuinely cares about others. I'm asking you to help us. The most difficult people to reach are your friends, your family members, and your coworkers. Those are the three most difficult people. Unsaved friends, unsaved loved ones, and co-workers. I'm asking you to help us on November the 6th to reach them and invite them to come. The Bible says, I looked on my right hand and beheld there was no man that would know me. I am praying that nobody in Rockwood or in East County will ever be able to say nobody cared for me. They may drive by and never attend this church, but I want them to know that we care about them and more important than us, that God cares about them. As we do, I think it merits that we define what it means by care. The definition of care, uh, formerly used in the Bible, in Old Testament, in the New Testament, was used in a painful sense of anxiety. Matter of fact, when you read about the parable of the sowers, you saw where the seed was sown, and when it was sown, uh, you saw that some of it was choked. Remember, it was choked by the cares of this world. That's the idea here of anxiety. But in reality, the definition of care, uh, I'm not trying to impress you, but it is both a noun and a verb. No man cares for my soul. The idea here is that a noun is the name of a person, a place, or a thing. And a verb is an action word. And care is both. There are some things that are so heavy, and if we were to put a name on it, it's the name of a person. How many of you right now are concerned about a person somewhere? You're concerned about a person. That's a care. 
if there is somebody that is concerned about a certain place. How many of you are concerned about America? That's a care. How many of us today would say, I'm concerned about something going on in my life or my children's life or in our nation? That's a thing. That's a, that's a care. But then it's also a verb. And when we look at this definition, what we're seeing is that the provision of what's necessary for health or welfare or maintenance and protection of something or someone else, it's to care. It's to, to offer that service. Sometimes when a person cares for another, they're known as a care what? Giver. Spiritually, we're to be caregivers. Matter of fact, the serious attention or consideration applied to do something or to avoid damage or risk that would call somebody to say to us, don't you care? That's what I'm talking about. It's to feel concern or interest or attachment or, or something that's important. It's to look after and provide for the needs of another. It's to care for. So when we think about this, 1 Peter 5 says, casting all your cares, all your care, a noun, upon him, for he careth, for you. That's a verb. And as we think about it, this noun, because there are cares, demands action. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm asking you as a church to help me and Regina and, and our church as we seek to let others know that, that we care. You know, the Bible tells us God cares for us. The Bible says in when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, and for, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to know, you may feel insignificant here. You may even think, surely God wouldn't care about me and my life, the sin that I the hole that I've dug with my life and where I'm at, God doesn't care about me. I want you to know He does. He knows your need, and today He cares about you. From the parable of the Good Samaritan, we read it just a moment, we have a clear example of how love cares is fleshed out. We know it says in verse 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said, What's written in the law, and how readest thou? He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he answered and said, Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? You see, the Jews had, had turned into a people not unlike the church. The Jews had turned into a people that loved themselves and hated everybody else. It's not unlike the church. The idea is they had no problem with the law that said they were to love another Jew. That was easy. But when it came to loving their enemies, that was a different story. Now, how many of you know there's some people, come on now, how many of you know there's some people easy to love? Say, come on, do you know that? Don't point at them, just say, yeah, I know somebody that's easy to love. How many of you know somebody that is really tough? The fact is, the prevailing opinion among the scribes and Pharisees was that one's neighbor were the righteous alone. If you wanted to define who our neighbor is, it's those good people. It's those that uh, were righteous. And according to the Jew, according to them, the wicked, including rank sinners such as tax collectors, politicians, <laughs> prostitutes, it's amazing they were all put in that same category. Gentiles, but especially Samaritans, especially Samaritans, they were to be hated because they were the enemies of God. They hated God. They hated His law. They hated the things that we stand for. How many of you understand today that there are people on the outside of this building today that drove by or live within shouting distance, they hate what we stand for? 
So are we to only love those that love us? Are we to love our neighbors? He included the unlovable. God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, by using a Samaritan in our story, Jesus disarmed the Jews for the Jews and the Samaritans were mortal enemies. They hated one another. The Jews hated the Samaritans And the Samaritans hated the Jews. Years ago, when I was a boy, we used to play cops and robbers. Good guy, bad guy. Cowboys and Indians. The Jews today play the Jews and the Arabs. (laughs) But in this day, it was the Jews and the Samaritans. They hated one another. They despised one another. As a matter of fact, to get his point across in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43, it says, Ye have heard that it's been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That was their thought. But he said, I say unto you, love your enemies and bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. I'm going to talk about it tonight more. But I'm telling you, God's done a work in my heart about this matter. I want to talk to you tonight about that. But here we see that Jesus was saying, no, it's not that you're to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You're to love your enemies as well. And from the parable of the Good Samaritan, we have a clear example of how love cares. He said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among thieves. There's no blame there. It could have been you on your way to the store. It could have been you on your way out to your car. It could have been you crossing the street. Whatever the situation, you found yourself a victim. And a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. I want to just give a, take a little liberty and say that a certain man probably in this story was a Jew. Probably it was a man... But it could have been any one of us. He was one of us. To the thieves, as they pass and saw this man passing by, to the thieves, this certain man was the victim to exploit. So they attacked him. They attacked him. To the priest and the Levite, this man that's lying on the side of the road He's a nuisance. Maybe they're at the end of your street and begging for money on the corner. Or or maybe they're underneath the bridge. Or maybe they are camped out in front of the mayor's house. (laughs) They're a nuisance. So the thieves saw him as a victim and so they attacked him. The priest and the Levite was a nuisance, so they avoided him. You know what I saw myself doing yesterday? Brother Brad, I was over there near Providence, and you know, as you get off the exit, you turn, there's always that young girl and that young guy right there. The same guy that's always at uh, Sunnyside and off the exit right there. Uh, Man, they can stare you down. Have you noticed that? You know what I found myself doing? I'm usually not easy to stare down. I can look you back in your God-given eyeballs. <laughs> but I found whenever I was looking at them, I found myself looking away. Just looking away. The fact is, that's what we want to do. We want to avoid them. But to the Samaritan, this man, probably a Jew, he didn't seem as a victim or as a nuisance Jesus said this Samaritan, when he walked by, saw him as a what? A neighbor. And so the Bible says he took care of him. What a lesson. It was not a Jew helping 
a Samaritan. We've got to understand, this wasn't a Jew that got up today that said, all right, I'm going to do a good deed. I'm going to help my enemy. It was his enemy helping a Jew. A Samaritan helping a Jew who had been ignored by a fellow man, by another Jew. The Samaritan loved those who were hating him. Even while he knew the man he was ministering to If he were conscious, he would spit on him or would have nothing to do with him. But it was this Samaritan that was helping him. He risked his own life, spent his own money. And as far as we know, he was never publicly rewarded or honored. But God noticed, tells about it, records this action for us to follow. And with that statement, I'd like to introduce to you, love cares. It doesn't look at the color of a person's skin or their financial record or their political position. Love cares. And he ended this story with a command, go and do likewise. Back in the beginning of this year, I shared the story that a man went to his neighbor and asked him to borrow his chainsaw. The man said, I can't because I'm eating black-eyed peas. The neighbor said, no, I'm serious. I have a tree laying in my driveway, and I need to borrow your chainsaw. The man said, I can't because I'm eating black-eyed peas. And the neighbor got upset and said, what does eating black-eyed peas have to do with you loaning me your chainsaw? The man said, when you don't want to loan your chainsaw, chainsaw to someone else, one excuse is as good as the other. Listen to me, church. I've discovered when it comes to reaching the lost with the gospel, there are all kinds of excuses. Some say, well, that's the preacher's job. That's what we pay you to do. No, you don't. It's our responsibility as Christians some say, well, I'm just too shy. I don't, I don't talk very well in front of people. You do on the phone. <laughs> well, I don't know how or I'm afraid. And if God wants them saved, well, then he'll save them. No, he wants them saved. And he made it clear. He gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on the cross. And he wants them saved. And he's commanded the church, believers, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The mission's emphasis made it clear that what's wrong is we need a heart for the harvest. The fields are white unto harvest. And you don't have to go to Africa and you don't have to go to China. All you have to do is step outside of these doors and the harvest field is white. It's ready for harvest. The truth is, When you don't want to tell somebody else about Jesus, one excuse is as good as the other. When I've already started talking about sharing these cards, some of you have already begun thinking, well, I'd like to do that, but you know, I just don't do that kind of stuff. I'll let other people in the church. I'll tell you, there'll be a time in eternity that you'll be glad that every person you tried to share your faith with was an accomplished desire. Don't just think about it. Don't don't just think, well, I hope somebody does. We're talking about a ship that's thinking. We're talking about a country that uh, this country, if there's anything that this country needs, it's to know that God's people care. And I'm asking you today, to realize that love that cares has several attributes that I want to point out to you. We're going to build on this. And if you could, if you could just imagine the word care, C-A-R-E-S. I want you to use each one of those letters and notice that love that cares, first of all, offers compassion. Our text makes it very clear. 
It says that that Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds and pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an end and took care of him. Compassion is a, is a, a, a very clear attribute that Jesus had. It said when he saw the multitude scattered, he was pro- moved with compassion. Jesus said, we're to go and to realize that the fields are wide unto harvest. So pray you therefore that the Lord or the harvest will send forth labors. He saw the crowds with compassion. Jeremiah said this, he said, mine eye, what I'm looking at, mine eye affects my heart. It's amazing to me. I don't know, I don't know how I get wrapped up into these things, but um, have you found yourself sometimes being able to see a commercial or to see uh, something that really touches your heart? And before you realize it, you're crying. Maybe over a movie. Or maybe over uh, something that is said. Um, I'm telling you, last night when, when Sisters Organ was playing the other team, and, and I love this, where they were playing, and they had a man on their team, a young man that was a, kind of a manager, and he had Dow syndrome, and he had never wore a uniform, never before been on the football field. He was always just handing water and towels to the players. But in the last quarter, sisters had gotten ahead far enough. They knew they were not going to lose. And they put a uniform on this manager. And they put him on the field and told the players, you make sure he makes a touchdown. And I'm telling you, it's recorded. You could see it on the news. It was on the news uh, last night. I saw it, Regina, it was right before I went to bed last night. And I saw it. And there was this this fellow has Down syndrome. He's running uh, with a football in his hand, and he's down, and I'm telling you, it's like he was running for the Seattle Seahawks. I mean, he was running, and do you know that everybody on the field, including his team and the other team, was cheering for them. The people in the stands was cheering for them. I was cheering for them, and when he got to the end zone, I was a basket case. (laughs) I was just crying. It just touched my heart. Isn't it amazing what causes us to cry? I didn't cry yesterday when I I saw those homeless people. I didn't cry last night when I thought about, I wonder where they're at. It's because Jesus said, Jeremiah said, my eye affects my heart. Somebody said compassion is defined best by it's your hurt in my heart. One of the things that I've tried to do, and I'm not saying I'm very good at it, but when I'm visiting somebody in a hospital or somebody that's lost a loved one, for just a little while, I try to slip underneath the burden that you're carrying. And I don't know you very well, but if you're hurting, I I can tell you I I have been to where people have lost so much, and I found myself grieving for them because I cared about them. Because Jesus cares. I told somebody this week, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I know somebody that's hurting when I see them. You may be that person today. I want you to know that not only should we have compassion, or that God has compassion, but that we also should have that compassion. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, Finally, be you all of one mind, having compassion one for another. In 1 John 3, it says that we need to be careful that our bowels are not shut up from compassion for others. Compassion makes reference to having a common passion. Let me ask you this. Do you remember what it was like to be lost? Do you remember what it was like before you got saved? Maybe some of you grew up in a home where you can't remember anything except of faith in Christ. You're a very blessed person. But I remember what it was like wondering, I wonder if anybody even cares about us. I wonder if anybody cares. Today, 100 plus kids were brought in to Sunday school because a bus captain or our church cared. 
Are we like the priest and the Levite that looks the other way and goes on about our business? I just want to tell you there's a world that needs Jesus, and we've got to share the gospel. Will you help us? Not only does a love that cares offer compassion, but secondly, a love that cares offers acceptance. As we look at this, the Jew and the Levite saw this man as a nuisance, but the Samaritan saw him as an equal. He understood it could have been him. It could have been us. By chance, there came down a certain priest that way, and he saw him and passed on the other side. A Levite was out of the place, came and looked on him and passed on by the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Of all the people to stop and help this man, was the Samaritan. Peter had it right in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. He said, God is no respecter of persons. We have, a, we have a way, and I'll talk about this tonight, but we have a way of assimilating people according to priority in our own eyes. But I want to tell you, for God so loved who? The world. And God is no respecter of persons, for there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And John 6, it says, All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. To any Pharisee or uh, priest or Levite-minded Christian, I want to remind you what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said. He says, Be not proud of race. Face, place, or grace. Now, I'm saying very clearly, black lives matter, but so do white lives. So do the Native American, and, and so do African American. and So anybody that you meet matters to God. We've got to get out of this superiority mindset. Amen. We've got to understand that As the song says, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. On our bus, we said red and yellow, black and green, the meanest kids you've ever seen. (laughs) He loves them. Love that cares offers compassion. Number two, offers acceptance. One of the things that I'm grateful for in church, you've helped me, that I've never invited somebody to come to church is you hadn't reached out and said, I'm glad you came today. Our ushers didn't pull a bulletin back or handshake. And there's nobody ever come by a visitor's table that hasn't been greeted and said, we're glad you came today. You see, caring involves not only compassion and acceptance, but thirdly, it involves redemption. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said, Take care of him and watch whoever thou spendest more. When I come again, I'll repay thee. You know, redemption is an expensive process. The Samaritan placed him in an inn, a motel of our day, and then pays for a two-week stay. In a real essence, he said, Here's my credit card. And I'm going away, and I'll be back in two weeks. And whatever the expense is, put it on there. And and if there's more when I get back, I'll take care of it. Wow. Jesus made it simple and practical. He moved from duty to love, from debating to doing. And while I don't think the Lord was condemning, discussing what we ought to do, or debating what's the best thing we can do, He was just warning us not to use those things as excuses for doing nothing. Love cares. We may may not be able to do everything, and we may not be able to fix everything. We can do something. We can do something. Maybe one day it'll be your home. Maybe one day it'll be your children. Maybe one day it'll be your grandchildren. But love cares. To redeem means to buy back. When to buy back, it has the idea of that which once belonged to you was lost and and somehow taken and stolen. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve fell into sin. Satan stole their holiness and righteousness. It had to be bought back. Adrian Rogers told about 
when he was pastoring down in, uh, near Merritt Island in Florida. He told about uh, how he had a little sailboat. He loved to sail out there uh, in the bay where he lived, and, and he loved it. And one day, somebody stole the boat, the trailer, the boat, stole it all. He said, I was so angry. I love that little boat. I, I helped build it myself. I knew it, I, and I loved it. Somebody had stolen it. And the preacher said one day, a month or so later, he was driving down A1A, and as he looked there in a, in a car lot was a boat on a trailer that had a for sale sign on it. He drove by and looked at it, and it was his boat. That was his boat. He turned around and went back and looked, and sure enough, he recognized it. He, he formed that boat. He built that boat. He went inside and said, I want that boat. That's my boat. It was stolen from me. And the owner says, sir, I don't know who you are or what you've been smoking, but that's my boat now, and if you want it, you got to buy it. He says, no, I owned it. I created it. It belongs to me. He said, sir, if you want that boat, it's got a for sale sign on it, and you're going to have to buy it back. You know what he did? He went down to the bank and got some money and came back, and he laid the money on it, and he backed his uh, vehicle up there and took the boat home. He bought it back. You know, that's what Jesus did for you and me. That's exactly what happened with us. We were created in God's image, but Satan stole us away. And one day, uh, Jesus came from heaven and went to the cross. He died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And when he arose again, the Bible says that if we'll believe by faith that Jesus died for our sins, that he would forgive us of our sin, and by his blood, we can be redeemed. That's what the Bible says in the book of Romans. For we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, but being justified freely by the grace through redemption that's in Christ Jesus, that he made him to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare us righteous. Ephesians 1 said we have redemption through his blood. Colossians 1.14, we have redemption through his blood. Hebrews 9.12 says by his own blood he entered into once the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And 1 Peter 1 says, For as much as you know, you were not redeemed by corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ and with the Lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, we have a ransom note that's been paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have the gospel that we can share. You can be saved. You see, love that cares not only identifies compassion and acceptance, but redemption. That man paid for it. He says, and if it's more, then I'll pay it. When I come again, I will repay thee. Do you know there's, there's no one in here that their sin is so great, so far, so deep, so broad that the blood of Christ can't save them? Not only does love that cares offer compassion, acceptance, and redemption, but look in Luke chapter 10, love that cares shows empathy. Verse 37, 36 and 37, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. The word empathy is it the emotion or the feeling that you understand and you share with another person's experiences and you have the ability to, to feel their pain? That's what we see from this Samaritan. I wonder how many times he had been cursed. I wonder how many times people had walked by him and spat at him and sneered at him. But there's something about somebody that's been there. There's something about somebody that understands our pain. There's empathy. The Bible tells us, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. 
and with his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What's that mean? It says that we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's why we can cast all our care upon him, because he cares for us. He never sinned, but he knows the temptation that we face. He understands the burden that we're under. In 2 Corinthians 8, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. A little boy came into a pet shop, and he saw the sign, Puppies for Sale. He went in, wanted to see the puppies. He was looking for one, and the owner opened up the cage, and there were several puppies that came bouncing out of there, but there was one that came out with a limp. And the little boy looked at all of them, held them, and uh, I don't know about you, but I'm a, I, I, you can get me with uh, uh, sad stories and puppies. I love puppies. He looked at the puppies, and... Finally, he said to the man, I'll take the one that has the limp. He says, look, son, that's the runt. You don't want him. He's never going to be able to run very fast. He's not going to be able to hunt. He's not going to be able to do very much. Get one of these other puppies. They're, they're in a lot better shape. He says, no, I want this one. And he said, why would you want the one that has the limp or the bad leg? And he reached down to his pants leg and he pulled it up and when he did it exposed that he was in a brace and that he was walking also with a limp he turned to the pet shop owner he says with this little puppy what he needs is somebody that will love him because they understand you know we all walk with a limp we all have been bruised but love that cares has empathy. God isn't looking to find fault in you. He's looking to love you as a sinner. And he gave his life for you. He cares for you. But not only do we see that love that cares has compassion and acceptance and redemption and empathy, but love that cares offers service. And he said, he that showed him mercy when asked who was the neighbor, then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. You see, that's the whole point of what we're talking about. Because of what Jesus has done for us, because of his care, Jesus loving us when we were unlovable, Paul said, for it's the love of Christ that constrains us. It's the love of Christ that compels us. Because we judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. That's why he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Who did he give that message to? He gave it to those that have heard the gospel. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. Who can share the good news better than somebody that has enjoyed the product of the good news, the grace that is afforded to all of us? Let me ask you as we close, love that cares offers compassion, acceptance, redemption, empathy, and service, and we see it all right here in Luke chapter 10. Let me ask you as Christians, do we really care about others, honestly? Do we really care? How many of you think as Christians we should? We should. Do we really care? Paul said in Romans chapter 10, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I shared with my Sunday school class this morning that a love that we're talking about is a love that cares. It's a love that says its prayers. Paul said, brethren, my heart to God in prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. Who are you praying for? Who is it that's on your heart? Not only does we see that it's a love that cares, a love that says its prayers, it's a love that dares to get involved with somebody else's life. They dare to do that. And finally, a love that cares is a love that shares their faith with someone else. That's exactly what we find here. Let me ask you this. Who do you know that's unsaved or unchurched? I'm not asking you to point them out or to raise a hand, but who do you know right now that they're 
Testimony would be, say, I look on my right hand, and behold, and there was no man that would know me. Refuge fell me, and no man cared for my soul. I wonder if right now, if you know somebody that might say that, if you might be able to break that chain and say, I care. I will care. Thank you for watching A Heart for God. We hope that the message was a blessing to you. And if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, would you let me help you do that right now? You say, how would I need to do that? First of all, by admitting the fact that we are all sinners and will one day die and face God in judgment. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, and it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this is the judgment. In Romans 6, 23, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. And in Romans chapter 10, in verse 10, the Bible says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. We must admit the fact that we are all sinners and will one day die and face God in judgment. Secondly, we must believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose again from the grave. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We must admit, we must believe, but thirdly, we must call upon the name of the Lord and ask Jesus to save us by repenting of our sin and placing our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Romans 6 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Ephesians 2, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 says that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but is long-suffering to us, word, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Admitting that we are sinners, believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sin, and calling on Him by faith and trusting in His promise, you can know you're on your way to heaven by accepting Christ as your Savior. Would you pray this prayer sincerely with me right now? Dear Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I'm sorry for my sins, and by faith right now, I claim your promise and ask you to come into my heart and to be my Savior. I'm trusting in you, Jesus, not a church, not a preacher, or anything that I can do. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my heart and making me your child. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please let us know of your decision and of your prayer request by calling the phone number or going to the website that's on the screen. We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you, and thank you for watching A Heart for God.